Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you look around you first? Look at the people around you. Can you give them a big smile first? There you go. It's good to see people smiling, isn't it? Welcome to our 9 a.m. service. My name is Christian. I'm one of the pastors here at Victory Fort. And we want to welcome you to our service here um, in the function hall of um, Every Nation Building. Now, um, if you're joining us for the first time, we hope that you know, this will certainly be, I uh, hope that this will, not, this will not be your last. Sana po makita pa namin kayo next week. We know that next week will be the start. It will mark the, I guess, the Holy Week. And so many of you perhaps have planned some vacations, some uh, things to do with the family. Next week we'll be announcing to you um, something that you can do. So the church is preparing something that you can do um, as we go through the Holy Week. And so watch out for that um, as we announce the details next week. But um, for this week, we are going to continue in our series called The Great Exchange. Before I go there, you know, uh, a few days ago, my wife, I, I talked to my wife, and as I opened my cabinet, you know, I talked to her and I told her, babe, I think I need, I need a new pair of jeans. And so she looked at me, and then she looked at the cabinet, and then she looked at me again, and she asked me, are we seeing the same thing that I'm seeing? And so when she, op when she pointed out, you see, you have all these jeans here in your cabinet. How come you're saying you need a new pair of jeans? How come, you need, how come you're saying that you need new jeans? Okay, you have a lot, okay? And so when I looked at it again, oh, nga, no, tama naman nga pala siya, no? meron naman pala. Kasi minsan, akala natin, di ba parang wala, tayo masuot. Any one of you here, you've been like that before? You went through your closet and you remarked to your mom or your, to your sisters or to your brother or even to someone else that you said, you know, I don't think I have the right dress today. I don't, have, I, I don't think I need, uh, I don't think I have dress or clothes. Or I don't, uh, I think I need to buy more clothes. And sometimes, you know, we experience that, isn't it? We, and we need, just like me, I need to be reminded that I do have. <laughs> I do have a pair. I do have several pairs. And so I need to be reminded of those things that I have inside my closet. Now, the same thing is true actually with this series. The reason why we're having this is if you consider yourself as a Christian and sometimes we think that our lives are lacking something, sometimes we think that our lives are, you know, we're in need of some rescuing and things like that and somehow we're worried too much or sometimes we're thinking, you know, of our lives less than we ought to be. You know, this is what this series is all about. In this series, we're looking at our spiritual closets, if you may, and see what do we have in Christ? And so that is why we have the great exchange. Our text, as we've been looking at, you know, for the past weeks now, this is our third week, is in the book of Ephesians. And so I'd like for us to read this passage of Scripture, and I'd like to invite everyone to please stand up as we read the Word of God together. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1, it says here, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest. Of mankind but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for your words, and Lord, we pray and ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand what your word says, Lord, in the book of Ephesians. And even as we look at this scripture, this passage, this content, Lord, of Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, 
we hope and we pray right now, Lord, that Holy Spirit, may you open up our eyes and may you allow us to see your truths so that we would understand them and not just understand but also live them out. Father, thank you that you're doing something, Lord, this morning. And you're going to do something special this morning in our hearts. And so we ask, Lord, be it unto you, Lord, according to your will today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Please have a seat. As we've mentioned in the past weeks, the book of Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul. And he wrote this when he was in prison. Now, if you will read, and I hope that you've been reading the book of Ephesians from chapters 1 all the way to 6. We hope that you're joining us in studying this. But when you do, I know that you would find it out that even though Paul was in prison, this letter was full of encouragement. This letter was full of instruction. This letter somehow is still full of faith. And if you would think about it, why was he full of faith? Although he was in prison, you would see that in the letter, he always and would several times refer, he referred several times to the words in Christ. And so there's something about his understanding of in Christ that enabled him to have faith, to have hope in the midst of prison, in the midst of being in a dire circumstance. Now, if you will split the book, first uh, three, and then the last three, the first three would actually deal with um, some doctrines, some theology, and some groundwork so that we would understand who we are in Christ. The latter part, chapters 4 all the way to 6, will discuss more about the things that we need to do in light of the reality of what was said in chapters 1 to 3. And so 1 to 3 deals with theology, 4 to 6 deals with lifestyle, 1 to 3 deals with doctrine, 4 to 6 deals with what to do. 1 to 3 deals with who we are in Christ. 4 to 6 deals with how we ought to live life in light of the fact that we are in Christ. Now, our text today in chapters 2, all 1 all the way to 10, there is actually a picture of who we were in the gospel of God. And in light of the gospel of God, what we ought to be and how to, ought, what to think of ourselves and how we ought to live you know, um, this, this gospel, we always say, is about good news. Have you heard of that uh, word, good news? That Christians would always say the gospel is the good news. And so a lot of people, they don't appreciate the good news because they don't know the bad news. Okay? In fact, we will appreciate better what the good news is if we know the bad news. I remember there's a doctor who said to the patient one day after the examinations, he said, um, sir, I have um, good news and bad news to you, okay? Um, the patient said, sir, what's the good news, okay? Um, the doctor said, good news is you only have 24, um, 24, 24 hours to live. And the patient said, how can that be good news? Well, what's the bad news then? Well, the bad news is I found, it out, I found out about it yesterday. Another patient, okay. Makukuha nyo rin po yan, okay. Patient naman po tayo dito, okay. So. Merong isa, sabi niya sa pasyente niya, um, Sir, meron po akong bad news sa inyo. Because I found out that you only will live for 10. And then the patient said, 10? Is it 10 days? Is it 10 hours? Is it 10 years? And then the doctor said, 9, 8, <laughs> 7, <laughs> Sige po, makukuha rin po. Pakisiko na lang yung kapat katabi natin. Okay, medyo maaga po kasi ngayon. So, baka hindi pa po ano eh. Kulang pa po sa kape. But then, again, going back to our point, we will not appreciate the bad news or the good news if we don't know the good news. And so that is why here in Paul's letter, he somehow explains to us, he points to us who we are, the bad news. It says there, it starts there with the words, and you, can you say, and you? Look at the person beside you can say, and you, and you. This is for all of us, okay? It says here, we were dead. Can you say dead? The Bible says, Paul said, and we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world and so on. See, that word dead there is uh, the word necros where we um, get the word necro uh, necrological or um, a service that we do, you know, for uh, those that passed away. And in this word dead, it's not just speaking to a physical dead, because he's addressing it to those people who are alive. How, can, how many of you know, you know, he's writing to people who can read, right? 
who are writing to people who somehow are still alive and can read. And so it's not just a physical death that he's speaking about. Paul here was talking about the three kinds of death. Number one is physical. Number two is spiritual. And number three, it's eternal. See, us as human beings, we know, actually I hope that we know, that we are not just temporal beings, but you and I are eternal beings. But we're not just mortal beings, but you and I also are spiritual beings. And so because of sin, what happened is, it says there, we were dead. That's why people die. That's why people end life here on earth, and it's because it's one of the effects of sin. But not just physical death, it's also speaking about a spiritual death. It speaks about us being not sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit anymore. We're not sensitive, we're not alive to the works of God anymore. That's what it means to die spiritually. But it also is speaking about, you know, the dead being eternally separated from God in hell. We're going to talk about that later. Okay? But that's what it means. Paul is saying, this is the bad news. All of us are dead physically, spiritually, and eternally. And this is because um, we were following the course of this world. This is who we are or who we were. We're following the prince of the power of the air. In other words, we are all under the influence and we are all slaves of the enemy called the devil. Do you realize that? See, before you gave your lives to Jesus, our situation, our state at that time is we're all imprisoned. We are all slaves. And the one who is in charge of us being there is the devil. And because we are his prisoners, you know, he can do to us whatever he wills to do to us. And then he goes on, says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Because we are sinful, because we are dead spiritually, because we are prisoners of the devil, we were living in lives that are according to the passions of the flesh. Lustful, arrogant, boastful, hate, uh, full of hate, carrying the desires of the body and the mind, and, why, and were by nature children of life, wrath like the rest of us. Okay po ba sa bad news? <laughs> Daming bad news, di ba? We were dead. We're imprisoned. We're captured by an enemy called the devil. And not just that, but he does to us everything that he pleases. But more than that, it says there, we are all children of wrath. That because of God's holiness, because God cannot tolerate sin, and because we are sinful, all of us are doomed to suffer the consequences of that sin. And I highlighted there, like the rest of mankind. In other words... Lahat po tayo. This is all of us. Can you look at the person seated right next to you? Please tell that person, this is about us. This is about all of us. I like how one pastor put it. It's as if one waiter is carrying a tray, and on it, there are several wine glasses. And he accidentally broke it. And then we broke it. Of course, all of the glasses there, all the wine glasses broke. Now, when he picked them up, all of them were broken, but it's just that um, they're di broken in different levels. Some are broken on the stem, some on the beak, some on the base, and so different kinds of cracks, different kinds of breakings. And you know what? That is a picture of all of humanity. We are all broken. It's just that some are broken different ways. Some are broken in the stem, some are broken on top, some are broken in the middle, some are broken in the base, but the bottom line is we are all broken. And no one is above the other. Some people, especially nowadays, you know, they think of themselves that they are more holy than a person because when they look at the brokenness of another person, they think of themselves as, you know, I'm not as evil, I'm not as crooked as you. Well, if we look at what the Bible says, whether you're broken on the stem or broken on top or broken in the base, we are all the same. We are all objects of the wrath of God. But here is what the Bible says after. But God, can you say but God? But God, being rich in mercy and because of the great love which he has loved us. I want to highlight those two words, but God. Can you say again, but God? Okay, medyo lakasan po natin ng konti. But God, 
Thank you. You see, I like how Paul wrote it. He wrote about the bad news, how we are dead to our, because of our sins, and how we are somehow imprisoned because of the enemy, and somehow we are doomed eternally. And in, and in painting all that bad news, he gave us the good news. And he said, but God. Somehow, he's wanting the people to understand that there was a shift that happened. There was a great exchange that happened 2,000 years ago. That because of Christ, this but God is now in effect. Now, I hope that you understand and appreciate that. But God. You see, you were dead, but God, as the scripture read, we read earlier, made you alive. You were imprisoned by the enemy, but God has set you free. You are doomed for destruction, but God, thanks be to God, we can receive eternal life. See, I hope that this, this word, but God, this is the greatest intervention. It is, is the greatest interruption in human history. A point wherein God somehow stopped the trajectory of man, and he said, I love them so much, and I don't want them all to perish. And so that is why he said he sent his son Jesus to live in the earth, die on the, die on the cross, and be raised three days after so that that trajectory, that destination can be stopped. And I just want to pray. This is, you know, somehow not related to the text, but I believe this is something that needs to be inculcated deep in our minds. And this is something, these two words are words that we, I hope we would always speak to ourselves. Because this is so powerful. But God. You see, this speaks about our eternity and our standing with God. But the Bible is also full of promises. And I hope that we will claim that. That in the midst, perhaps, of financial difficulty, you may say to yourself, I may be facing this huge mountain of debt, but God is my provider. I am facing this sickness and I think this is impossible to be healed as the doctor says, but my God is my healer. You know, you may be facing some relational conflicts and it seems like it's impossible to be mended. You can declare and say to that situation, say, but my God is my reconciler. You may be facing an impossible situation, but you can say, but God, all things are possible with my God. Amen. I hope that we would have that faith because this is true. This intervention, this interruption by God is so powerful that it can change our lives and the trajectory of our lives. Now, he enumerates now some of the things that we ought to appreciate about our God. It says there, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Can you say alive? How many of you are seated beside someone who's alive? Yeah, all right. We were made alive. I want to highlight that. He made us alive together with Christ. What Paul was saying here is we were dead in our sins, but God made us alive in Jesus Christ. How many of you appreciate that truth? Amen. God made us alive. You and me alive in Jesus Christ. See, because of our sins, the Bible says we're all dead. And when you're dead, you're kind of helpless, isn't it? To illustrate that, I want to call one of our campus ministers and our pastors here to just um, join me here on the stage. James, can you join us as well? Can you please bring that one? Thank you. Okay, you can all go on that side. So these are our campus ministers. You, saw, you heard James earlier encourage us. Okay, just to give us a picture. Imagine that we were in the boat. All of you were in a boat. And the boat capsized. And you were threading on water for so long, but you gave up. And somehow you died. Can you pretend that you died? You died, okay. <laughs> pretend dead, okay? Okay, sige. Kanya kanya akti ng konte, yeah. Now, this is a life saver, isn't it? Salbabida, okay, in Tagalog. Now, if they're dead, just pretend dead. Okay, okay, all right. If I throw this one, what happens? Nothing, isn't it? Why? Because they're dead. No matter how good I am with ring toss, okay. Okay. 
No matter what effort I do, it's nothing. It won't amount to anything. But you know, the good news of the gospel is God did not just send us a life raft. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, with Him 2,000 years ago. And us who were dead somehow grabbed us and revived us and made us alive. Boy, can I? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so that you can hang on to Him. See, this is a picture of what God does to us. Amen? We were dead, helpless, hopeless, nothing that we can do to save us. But yet, because of what Christ has done, you and I have been revived. You and I have been raised from the dead. You have, you're spiritually speaking, and now we can respond in faith. Can we give uh, this, uh, this man a big round of applause? Thank you so much. But see, you have a, res you have a response, isn't it? You can choose to reject Jesus, and you can choose to reject the lifesaver, you can choose to go back to the water. Or you can respond in faith. See, the Bible says that the proper, see, the Bible says that we were, it is by grace, let me highlight this one. It is by grace that we have been saved through faith. The proper response, the appropriate response to the lavish, extravagant grace of God is faith. What is that faith? You see, if I were one of those who were dead and Christ raised me, responding in faith is not rejecting Him. Responding in faith is not turning my back to Him and swimming in the waters again. Responding in faith is just embracing Him and thanking Him and appreciating what He has done so that now that I am alive, I can go and reach out those who were dead and bring, him back to, bring them to Him. See, that is what faith is all about. That's our choice that you and I, okay, were given to. See, this part here of Scripture, it has four elements. It's grace, it's salvation, it's faith, and it's works. And I want to just somehow um, use this opportunity to give us perspectives because a lot of people, somehow, they have different interpretations of how people are saved. Now, I'm going to show you some um, seemingly mathematical equations, but let me tell you, this is not a perfect equation, okay? But somehow, I hope that this will help us understand what salvation is, biblically speaking, okay? Some people say that grace plus faith plus works is what will make you saved. Now, obviously, the Bible says otherwise, and this kind of thinking is what we call legalism, some people are saying, you will be saved and your lives will go to heaven one day when you give to the poor, when you pay indulgences, when you pray and when you go visit churches, when you attend services, when you join a particular church, that is how you will be saved. You do good so that you can be saved. You know, the Bible is saying, not a single good thing that we do will merit us a salvation. And so this is not the right equation. Grace plus faith minus works is how people will be saved. That's how, others, how other people put it. And this is what we call antinomianism or anti-work or anti-law. And so there are some teachers, preachers nowadays, very famous preachers. Maybe you've heard them preach about this, that grace covers everything. And so that you don't need to repent and though you don't need to, you know, somehow um, go to God and after you repented, no matter how, what kind of sin you commit after, you don't need to repent. And he's saying, you know, it's not by works and that's basically what's called antinomianism. Famous preachers nowadays are espousing them, this, which is also false theology. Now there are those that say grace minus faith minus works equals being saved. Some preachers would tell you that grace ultimately will cover everything. And so even the people who are in hell will one day go to heaven because of God's gracious love. Now, if that were the case, why did Jesus have to die 2,000 years ago? See, this is, what, this is what it's called universalism or extreme, hyper, hyper grace. Now, the Bible puts, us this, puts salvation this way. It's grace plus faith. Or grace through faith 
will lead us to salvation, that will inspire us, fuel us to do good works. Again, um, this is a simple equation, not a perfect illustration though, and so I want to warn you, some of you who are very good with mathematics, you're already calculating, but if A equals B, and B plus C is like, okay, so please don't go there. <laughs> but this just hopefully can give us an idea of what this scripture in Ephesians um, 2 verse 8 is telling us. Now it goes on to say, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I want to highlight these two words, raised, or three words, raised us up. Can you say raised us up? He did not just revive you. He did not just make you alive. He raised you up. It's very important. One of our pastors used to be a medical practitioner, told us the importance of this. He used to work for the ER emergency room. And what happens when they um, uh, bring a person who's dying and suddenly flat lines, what the nurses would do or the doctors would do, they would use that defibrillator, isn't it? And then they would, um, you know, somehow jolt the body with electricity so that there would be heartbeat again. Now, that's what you call revive. But he said, raised up is different. See, you may have come to the, doc to the hospital, you know, on a stretcher or on a flat bed. And then revive. But to be raised up is what happens to you when you step out of the hospital. Raised up happens when you are able to walk again. Raised up happens when you're able to do the things that you can do um, when, you're you're, when you're dying and somehow flatlining. That is what it means to be raised up again. More than just resuscitated, the Bible speaks of it as revivified. Okay? Hindi po ako nagkamali na ng pronunciation. Ganun talaga siya. Revivified. Okay? R-E-V-I-V-I-F-Y. Which means this. To raise up from moral death, to live a new and blessed life devoted to God. If God's point of us save, being saved is so that you can go to heaven one day, how many of you know, the moment you receive Jesus Christ, maybe the best thing to do is just you just die at that, at that, that point, isn't it? Nag-altar call ka, biglang namatay na lang lahat yung nag-altar call dito sa harap. If that was the point, but you know what? That's not just the point of us being saved. God saved us, not just so that we can go to heaven one day, but God saved you and me so that we can experience being raised up from moral death. And to live a new and blessed life devoted to God. In other words, we used to be slaves of the enemy. We used to be slaves of the devil. But God set us free so that we can live a devoted and blessed life in Jesus Christ. You see, remember, we were dead. And we were in prison. Just think about a dead person first. Suppose I'm dead. If I'm dead, obviously I cannot do anything. I'm at the mercy of the people who are living around me. And so if my body is just there and dead, and that's a picture of who, who we all were or all are, here's what happens to us in the past or what happened to us in the past. Some of you, you're wondering, why is it hard for you to say no to pornography? Some of us were wondering, why is it say, hard to, for us to forgive? Why is it hard for us to control our anger? Why is it so easy for us to steal from others and defraud others and somehow uh, take advantage of others? It's because we were dead. Because the enemy was in control of our lives and we cannot do anything about it. Ginagawa pala nung kaaway sa atin nung araw, dinadamitan ka. Nilalagay, sinasaksakan yung utak natin ng kung ano-ano, it's because He's the one who's in control of our bodies. But the good news is, God said, but God, in Christ, we were made alive. And so now that we are alive, the Bible says in Titus 2.12, the grace of God that has appeared before all to all men teaches us to say no. Can you say No. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness because you are now alive in Christ. You can say no now to the devil. 
Because you are alive in Christ, you can say no now to the things that He wants to interject or to engrave in your mind. Because you are now alive in Christ, you can forgive. You can be generous. You can be, you know, forgiving. You can somehow be less angry or cannot be angry and not sin. And so you can do all of these things because you are in Christ. But here's the sad reality. A lot of people who have been made alive by God are still living as if they were dead. A lot of Christians, unfortunately, although they've been made alive in Christ, they think they don't have a choice. They think that the enemy is still in control over their lives. Listen here, everyone look here. Don't let the enemy treat you like a punching bag. Don't let the enemy treat you like a punching, gun, punching, punching bag. You see, you were made alive by Christ. Not so that you can live defeated lives, but you were made alive by Christ, in Christ, so that we can live victorious Christian lives. Amen? How many of you believe that? How many of you appreciate that? How many of you know we need to thank God because of that? Amen? Come on, let's give God a praise. Some of you really need to preach this in your heart. It has to be reminded and it has to be so true in us that all things are possible in Christ. Yes, you used to be struggling in those areas, but guess what? The God in you is greater than the temptations around you. The God in us is greater than the pressures around us. That the God in us is greater than the problems around us. All things are possible. So I'm, I'm envisioning through eyes of faith. Some of us here, perhaps, we, we struggle with certain things. We struggle, perhaps, with lust. We struggle, perhaps, with pride. We struggle, perhaps, with unforgiveness. But I tell you, one day, one day, you will look back and say, wow, God has completely set me free from that. You will testify to your, to your friends. You will testify to your families who are struggling with the same issues. And you will say to them, I used to be like that, but God set me free. I used to be like that, but God made me alive and allowed me to experience His victory. How many of you are you're excited for that? Amen? We are excited for that kind of freedom that God gives. Not only did He raise us up, but it says here, He seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's something that will happen to us in the future. Something that we experience, but also something that we will experience in the future when we meet Jesus Christ face to face. So that in the coming ages, He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward Christ Jesus. Last point. We were doomed to hell in eternity, but God in Christ secured us eternally. We're all doomed to go to hell one day, but yet because of Christ, we can be eternally secure in Him. Jesus would speak about hell um, more than He would talk about heaven. If you would look at the Gospels, look at His preachings, there's so many times that He spoke about hell. In one of those accounts, in Mark, Mark chapter 9, verse 48, just look at it later, it says there, it's a place, hell is a place where worms do not die and fire is not quenched. You know, um, two weeks ago, I have this friend who happened to enjoy watching YouTube videos of probably of some of the most gory stuff, stuff out there, okay? And so he showed me this video of this African dog um, that has a lot of parasites on the skin. I don't want to be gross, okay? But then that was, um, it was a, uh, you know, what they did, the doctors did is they squeezed the skin, they I guess pinatulog yung aso, but then when they squeeze the skin, poop, nagpop na lang yung mga, ano, ano. So, yung mga worms, maggots, that, like this. Okay, sorry, I, I, I don't want to be uh, gross and I don't want to ruin your appetite later. Okay? But imagine, hell is a place where worms like that don't die. I don't want to be in that place. Now, theologians said, those are not literal worms. 
It's something that pertains to the kind of torment that will eat us alive for eternity. It's the torment of not believing our friends, not believing our classmates, not believing our office mates, not believing our loved ones, that Jesus really is the Son of God, the Savior of all, the Lord of heaven and earth. It's that torment that will somehow plague those who will be in hell for eternity. Jesus also said it's like fire that's never quenched. Now, I'm liking um, how to bake recently. And so when you set the oven, you know, um, say for 175 degrees or 200 degrees, and when it's ready, when you open up that oven, you know, I, I, I did it one time. I opened up the oven, and when I opened it, wow, it was so hot. It's like all the heat just went to my face the moment I opened it. And whenever I would reach into the oven, I have to, uh, I have, to have those um, uh, oven mitts, right? In fact, uh, when I went to the bake shop, I had to look for the oven mitts that almost covers my whole arm. <laughs> because I know how hot it is inside the oven. And that's just 200 degrees. Can you imagine hell? Can you imagine the fires of hell? Sulfur that doesn't end. Now, I don't want to scare you. A little bit lang. So that's what the Bible says. But you know what? God said, I don't want my children to go there. That's why he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us 2,000 years ago be raised from the dead three days after so that you and I can also be raised with Him and be seated with Him in the heavenly places as that Bible says, Bible Scripture says. It says there, in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages He might show, this is a picture of what heaven is, okay? So that He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness. What is heaven like? I hope I, I, I don't wish to bob the, uh, pop the bubble on some. You know, heaven will not be pla a place where angels dressed in diapers, you know, and floating around, okay? So that's not heaven. But here's a nice, a beautiful picture of heaven. Heaven is a place where the kindness of God is everywhere. Heaven is a place where the kindness of God is experienced. And this kindness is experienced because of His grace. Now, His grace, now some of us can be gracious to people, but it only has some limits. But the limits of God's grace is according to His immeasurable riches. In other words, eternity is not enough for us to fully experience the gracious kindness of God. That is what heaven is revelations put it this way it's a place where there's no more tears a place where there's no more pain a place wherein you don't have to struggle with sin anymore because god somehow will fi finally step on sin and death so it will no longer have an effect on you and me how many of you would like to be in that place one day amen Come on, let's give God a hand. Okay, not yet, though. But one day. That's something that we can look forward to. See, that is why the people of Christ, that is why the people of God, you know, they're not afraid of dying because they know death is just a transition point. Death is just a transition point that the moment you close your eyes here on earth, when you open it, you will be there in heaven with Jesus stretching out his arms to you and saying to you, welcome home, son. Welcome home, my daughter, if you are in him. And so in summary, again, because of Christ's love for us, because of God's love for us, we were doomed, but God made us alive. We were imprisoned. We were destined for, for hell, but God set us free. 
and eternally secured us in heaven. Now again, that is what the cabinet looks like when we open it. That is what's in store for us when we open up the cabinet of faith. When we open up the closet of what we have in Christ, we are alive, we are free, and we are eternally secure in Him. I'd like for us to stand up as we pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you that you have turned our lives that were dead and you made us alive in you. Lord, you also made us, Lord, you raised us up as well so that we can experience a blessed, a devoted life to you for the rest of our lives. God, Lord, you also secured us eternally. That though we were destined for doom, Lord, Lord, you have somehow changed our trajectory. And because of your love, as we receive that gift, as we embrace what Christ has done for us and appreciate him for it, Lord, you have secured our lives eternally. And for that, Lord, we are grateful. For that, Lord, we are grateful. You know, as we, before we end, I'm going to pray for a few more groups of people, but I'd like for us to just take this time to appreciate our God and thank Him for what He has done as we sing this song. Let's sing the chorus part.
pray for two groups of people right now. Some of us here, God has made you alive, but yet you feel like it's not. Some of us here, perhaps we thought that, you know, uh, or, or we're living as if, you know, you know somehow the, 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 in the entanglement of the past is there's very strong with you. It's still very strong. Some of us, we're still struggling with a few things, but I believe God's grace is here. The grace that brings us victory is here. And so right now, thank you for the freedom, God. Thank you for the grace, Lord, that you shower us abundantly every day. And so if you are here as an act of faith and as an act of humility, you need that grace to be free. You need that grace to be free. You need that grace to be somehow be stronger than your struggles. Even now, can you lift up your hands towards heaven right now so that I can pray for you? Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord. Lord, even now, Lord, let the power of God that raised us up, Lord, even now be so real, so true in us, Lord, that no matter what the enemy will throw at us, Lord, no matter what sin, no matter what temptation, Lord, we will be stronger in Christ, oh God. Father, even now in Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we break, Lord, we break in Jesus' name, Lord God, what the enemy has called upon them. We break any scheme, Lord God. We break the chains, oh God. We declare them free in Amen. Praise God. I want to pray for one more group of people before we end. Some of us here, maybe this is your first time. Maybe this is your second or one week. You know, for several months now you've been coming. But you are not yet that secure of your eternal destination. You're not, just, not yet sure if you are really in Christ. You know what? The Bible says it is a gift that God gives. It's by grace through faith. He is extending right now His hand to us and He's saying to us, will you receive it? Will you receive that gift of salvation today? Will you receive that gift of forgiveness today? Will you receive that life that He is giving to you today? And if that is you, I want to ask everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads. If that is you, you want to make a decision today to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You want to receive that gift that He's extending. This is the moment. God has set for you. If you want to make that decision, can you please lift up your hand so that I know who to pray for? Yes, praise God. Many hands lifted up. Praise God. Praise God. In fact, can I invite you? Can I invite you to make a bold statement today? Can you step out from where you're at, step out from your seats, and go here in front? Can you come here in front, please? This is not to embarrass you. This is not to put you on the spot. This is because you are making a stand before heaven today. This is because you're making a stand before God. Lord, no longer will I live that way. No longer will I live in the way that displeases you. But today, I'm making a decision to put my faith, receive that grace, receive that life, receive that forgiveness, receive that assurance in Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Can I ask some of the Victory Group leaders and interns to just please stand beside them? Praise God. Those who went in front, can you just look up here for a moment? You know, by, uh, through eyes of faith, you know, by faith in what Christ has done, I believe the Lord is declaring to you, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. I believe the Lord is saying to you as well, no matter how dark, no matter how gloomy your past is, the Bible says He has removed it as far as the east is from the west. You may have been living somehow defeated lives, but I believe from this day forward, God's going to do such a powerful work in you that the victory of Christ will be experienced by you every single day. Amen? Amen. Can I invite you to pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to save me. This day, I repent from my sinfulness. I acknowledge that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And so today, Jesus thank you for what you have done I receive the gift that you give today 
thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for the assurance of eternal life that I receive today. Thank you that you will give me the grace to live for you from here on in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You know, um, the people behind you, will, they will just explain to you more about the decision that you made. But as we go, can we just all lift up our hands towards heaven for the last time today? Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your immeasurable, rich grace, oh God. Father, we thank you. May we experience that more and more in our lives. I declare for every person, every family here, Lord, may the peace of God that transcends all understanding be upon us. May the grace of God enable us every day. May the strength of the Lord empower us every single day this week. And may we live a blessed life and a, a life that will be a blessing to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. We are dismissed.